I want us to consider one verse. I don't usually speak on just one verse, uh, and it's not even the whole verse. So I've been reading and listening to a lot of Puritans, so maybe that's what uh, uh, came upon me. But in uh, John 4, 14, verse 6, in, in um, response to Thomas's question, uh, you know, talk about a frustrating teaching ministry. That was Jesus' ministry with his uh, disciples. He, he, Jesus pours his heart out, and you think, okay, now they got it, and they then ask a question that, that, that shows that they really didn't get. But uh, in verse 5, Thomas asks Jesus, uh, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We live in a time in a society where it is increasingly common for biblical views on social issues to be labeled insulting. To the point that often Christians are kind of afraid of talking or interacting on issues like abortion or homosexuality or transgenderism or even uh complementarian roles in the family and in the church. Uh, it, it is an offensive to an ever-expanding number of people to say that a woman who has feelings for another woman should not express love for her in marriage. Now, that's becoming more and more offensive. Uh, it, it doesn't take long for a Christian to be backed into a corner on this issue, not wanting to be offensive, uh, yet wondering how to respond. Yet, we as Christians must recognize that a biblical view of homosexuality or gender roles, marriage, whatever it is, is not the greatest offense in Christianity. If we are afraid of, in, of being offensive to a world on these social justices, we're not even considering the most offensive thing about Christianity, which is the gospel itself. The greatest offense that we have to offer to the world is the offense of the cross, as Paul refer, refers to it in, in Galatians. Uh, the gospel is, is the lifeblood of Christianity, and when we truly believe the gospel, we begin to realize that the gospel not only compels Christians to confront social issues and the culture around us, but also the gospel actually creates confrontation with the culture around us, not, but not just with the culture around us, but within us uh, as well. So the offense of Christianity begins with the gospel, and the offense of the gospel begins in the beginning, in the very beginning of the Bible, in the beginning, God. The initial front of the gospel is that there is a God by, through, and for whom all things begin. The it is all about God, because all things begin with God and ultimately exist for God. Nothing in our, our creation is irrelevant to Him. And because God is our Creator, we belong to Him, and that's very offensive to the world. It really doesn't matter what age you live, that the offense of the, of the gospel is the same. The Holy Spirit was right, of course, when He said in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. If you study the different worldviews or different philosophical ideas that developed through the centuries, they tend to be leftovers warmed up from something else that was thought before. And my contention is that you can trace all that to Genesis chapter 3 and how Satan interacted with, uh, with uh, Eve. I mean, the false philosophies, not, not true philosophies there. So we belong to God. The, the one who created us owns us. We are not, as a poem Invictus declared, describes the master of our own fate or the captain of our own souls. Uh, the author of all creation possesses authority over all creation, including over all of us here today and in this world. And we are accountable to him, not only as a creator, but also as our judge. And that's offensive to people. One of the core truths of the gospel is that God will judge every person and he will be just in doing that. And this puts us in a position where we are desperately in need of his grace. 
now we see the offense of the gospel is starting to come to the forefront as we, we talk about it. Tell any modern person that there is a God who sustains, owns, defines, rules, and one day will judge him or her, and that person will be highly offended. And this is our normal reaction to God since the fall. This, this is not abnormal. The opposition we find to the gospel is normal in the context of the fall. It's abnormal in the context of God's original design, but it's normal according to our, or, or perhaps a better word to use is natural, is according to our nature, uh, a, fallen, a fallen nature. Think of Satan's original temptation. Satan's temptation, original temptation to Eve continues to be what attracts humanity today. Has God really said, no, not believing what God says is true? You can be like gods. Remember, that's the promise, really, at, ultimately, is autonomy. You can be like gods without needing to follow the God who created you. And that's a, the, the, the attraction to humanity today, usurp, to usurp God's authority over us. And it all begins when the command of God is reduced to questions about God. Uh, I don't know if you see the the, the, the stickers in cars question everything. Mm -hmm. That's the model of postmodernism, right? The postmodernism as a philosophy has run its course in, in, in the academic philosophical discussion, but it's still the popular philosophy of our of our culture, and that's the that's the model question everything is god really holy does he really know what is right is god really good does he really want what is best for me those are questions that come into our minds as we start to deviate from what the scriptures say and with these questions then men and women subtly assert themselves not as the ones to be judged but the ones who are judging god himself uh, the temptation in the garden was to rebel against God's authority and in the process make humans the judge of morality, knowing good or evil, deciding what is good and evil. Is that another offer, something that Satan offered them? You will be able to judge. God is keeping something from you. And when we say no, the truth is that there is one God who is judge and not you. That's offensive. To those, regardless of what your view of abortion is, regardless of what your view of homosexuality is, that's a core offense that comes from Christianity. So, the really the main point here is, is that you cannot really be a Christian without being offensive. Mm -hmm. Now, we want to be biblically offensive, right? We want to be the offense of the offense of the cross, not because we are jerks. Is that the people are offended. But if you're afraid of offending people because of your views on the social justice issues, um, you have no hope to give to the world because the gospel itself is very offensive. When we understand this first sin, you know, Adam's and Eve's, uh, we realize that the moral relativism of the 21st century is nothing new. Because exactly what Satan did in Genesis 3 was to relativize God's word and put man in judgment of his word. And when we attempt to usurp or even eliminate God, we lose objectivity for determining what is good and evil, right and wrong, moral and immoral. A sample of this, Michael, I think his name is say Ruse, R-U-S-E, he's a Canadian philosopher. And he says this, the position of the modern evolutionists, therefore, is that morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth, considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, it is illusory. So morality is just something that came into being, it's not objective. If you think it is, uh, objective you're believing in some sort of illusion that uh, evolution has brought into uh, into place. Now, it, the, you probably all know the name Richard Dawkins, claims to be a, no, a biologist, biologist philosopher. He's neither. <laughs> uh, uh, he has a college degree in, in, in science, but not, he's not trained in either of these areas. Um, he says this, 
in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic rep replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky. And you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at the bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no other good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is. And we dance, dance to its music. Now, Richard Dawkins decided that God doesn't exist, and he hates him. It was interesting, you know, when you read his writings, you get this idea that it's not that, that he just doesn't believe that the, the divine exists. He, doesn't, he, he, does, he, he denies the existence of the divine, and he hates that person who doesn't exist <laughs> as well, right? Um, but that's why when you put God aside, that's what happens. And godless worldviews leave us with a hopeless subjectivity concerning good and evil that is wholly dependent on social constructs. Is whatever uh, you know, Simon's neighborhood in Zambia decides is good for them, when it's bad for them, that's what it is. And then you come to the remote area of Yelm or Roy, uh, that tribe there decides, and then Ryan's know what's good there. And you come to the Haifalutin North End, then that tribe decides what is, is good and, and what's not. But whatever a culture deems is right, and whatever a culture deems wrong is wrong, that's what, that's what it is, because we've taken God out of the picture. And this is precisely the worldview that prevails in American culture today, where rapid shifts in the moral landscape clearly communicate that we no longer believe certain things are inherently right or wrong. Think about how normal, and I mean in that sense, how normal gay marriage seems to be to us today. Okay, And the Ober Oberfeld decision was only nine years ago. It just feels like it's always been the case because things just move so quickly. Nine years is an eternity when culture is changing so rapidly. And instead, instead, rightness and wrongness are determined by social developments around us, not by what God says. Think about it. Aren't the implications of this approach to morality frightening? Let's take an example. Okay, Consider sex trafficking. I do not know a person other than the people doing the trafficking that would say, yes, this is neither good nor bad, is irrelevant, there's no morality to it. Even the most avowed atheists, I think, would still mm -hmm. say this is, this is wrong, with no, with no basis to saying that that is wrong, because they would have to borrow from a Christian worldview to say that, but they still that. But are we willing to conclude that as long as a society approves of this industry, it is no longer immoral? If there was somewhere, a group of people, a society that has fully functional society decided, you know what, we no longer think that sex trafficking is immoral. We actually think it is a great moral good. Would we be, okay, as long as you decide for yourself, that's good. I don't think that is a fair. Are, are we wi willing to tell young girls sold into sex slavery that they and the men who take advantage of them are merely dancing to their DNA, like Richard Dawkins says, that what is happening to them is not inherently evil, and that they are just product products of a blind, pitiless indifference that lets them let that that's left them unlucky in the world. I don't know that anybody, Christian or non Christian, would be willing to say that. And that this may not be what most people would say to these girls, but this is the fruit of the worldview that may many people unknowingly profess. That's where Richard Dawkins' position must logically lead you to, because we left God out. And I think God has been left out in great part, at least in American culture, because the church itself has been offended by the gospel and has not been able to offend the world with the gospel. Other things have become more distinctives of the church than the gospel itself. Thankfully, the gospel is completely countercultural in, in this respect. 
Sin is, sin is real rebellion against the good creator of all things and the final judge of all people. Sex trafficking is unjust because God is just and he will call sinners to account before him. And, and such an understanding of sin helps inform why Christians must work to end tra sex trafficking. Because it's against what God says. This is also why these same Christians in churches must also work to oppose abortion, defend marriage, and so on, because it's against the God who saves and who judges and who gives us his word. But the gospel is also offensive because it turns us away from ourselves. Have you ever looked at a dictionary and see how many self-hyphenated words are there? Like self, hyphen, something else. We live in a culture of self that is all about me. We are now experiencing the first generation of adults that has grown up in a school system that teaches that they're number one. Mm -hmm. They're number one, self-esteem. You want to think highly, oh, everything you do is great. And then they hit the real world now. Mm -hmm. And you know, depression diagnosis is way out. Uh, all kinds of different things are going on. Production is uh, all-time low in, in the workforce and so on. But uh, no, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-advertisement, self-gratification, self-glorification, self-motivation, self-pity, self-applause, self-centeredness, self-indulgence, self-righteousness. And that's just a little bit of all the different self-hyphenated words that we have. And yet the gospel turns us outside of ourselves. Does anybody, can anybody quote 2 Corinthians 5, um, or even paraphrase, 14 and 15? You know, the, love of, the love of Christ compels us and to, to do something. The love of Christ compels us to recognize that we're dead, and instead of living self-focused lives, now we, self, we live self, other-oriented lives through Jesus Christ. So that's the power of the gospel. And we tell people that, Eric, you must die to yourself and live for others. And wait a minute. Who is going to watch out for number one? <laughs> right? And that's, that's offensive to others. And then the uniqueness of Jesus is more offensive than any biblical view on social issues. What you believe concerning Jesus is more offensive to the world than your view of abortion, than your view of homosexuality, than of your view of sex trafficking. Because you come to people and say, unless you believe in him, unless you recognize that you're a sinner and that you can have no hope apart from him, he is the only way, people are going to be offended at that. Uh, my dad is not a believer. Uh, he considers himself an eclectic. He, I think he considers, himself, he considers himself a Christian. He tolerates all kinds of views. The only thing he doesn't tolerate is, is any claims of exclusivity. Mm -hmm. says that uh, that's the only thing that can't happen is to say there's this there's only one way and yet that's what Jesus says to all his apostles it's only through me if, if not through me there is no no uh, way to God you know most people like would say they like Jesus because Jesus is <coughs> kind, he is loving, he championed the cause of the needy and the poor, he made friends with the neglect, the weak, the downtrodden, he hang out, hung out with the despised and rejected, he loved his enemies and taught the elders to do the same. Yet, Jesus made some amazingly, wildly egocentric claims. Did he? Didn't he? Like, Nope, you cannot come to, to God except it's through me. Um, if you don't believe in me, you're going to perish. Uh, those are some very self-centered, self-egocentric claims that they either are who you're saying you are, or you're not a good person. Mm. And that's offensive to the world who thinks that they are <coughs> number number one. And they might, you now they tell them, this to them, to the world, and they may ask you, are you really saying that there is only one way to God? That's, I think, the immediate, ask, immediate question they ask. But even as we ask this question, we reveal the problem. Do you know what? If we said there's a thousand ways to God, that would be offensive because there isn't a thousand and one. Mm -hmm. And that's an offensive way 
to uh, offensive thing. But I think the most offensive thing of Christianity is the cross, heaven, and hell. There's nothing. So far, people are offended, but they might still be talking to you. But when you start talking about the cross, the need of the cross, heaven and hell, now you're really um, offending people. So the offense of the gospel reaches its peak when you tell people that their eternal destiny is dependent on whether they believe the man hanging there on the cross is their God, the Lord, Judge, Savior, and King of all creation. And as soon as you say, if you follow him, you experience eternal life, and if you don't follow him, you experience everlasting hell, you'll find yourself across a line of utmost contention in contemporary culture, and sadly, in contemporary church. Um, we... It was a pleasant meeting. I had a meeting, a, a counseling session this morning with somebody who's been attending our church. And it was refreshing, but it did show what I'm saying here. Uh, a few weeks ago, one of, our, one of our elders was preaching. He preached on Nahum 1.7. And he was very clear on hell and heaven and believing Jesus and, you know, that kind of stuff. And the, this person's was there with his, his girlfriend and said she had never heard she's been in church for 15 years she's never heard that before and this is these are not like liberal as we think of liberal churches these are in the pale of bible leaving churches and this guy was thankful for that a lot of people are not thankful for for that the most offensive claim in Christianity is that God is the creator, owner, and judge of every person on the planet. And if you do not believe in his son, you're going to go to hell. And that's the reality. Do you mean that my grandma is in hell? Well, if she didn't believe in Jesus, that's where she is. Remember when my youngest son was maybe two, uh, we went to Mount Vernon with my my mom. You know, everybody piled up in the minivan and go to Mount Vernon to see the tulip, tulips up there. And we put Isaac, that's my youngest son, in the back in his car seat and we're driving and we hear this little voice. Grandma's dad is in hell. <laughs> Talk about my mom's father. <laughs> and is he talking about my father? And then I had a choice. Either do I go against what my son is rightly saying or do I try to you know, patch things and said, yeah, so, then mom, that's exactly what Isaac is saying because that's, he understands that if you don't believe in Jesus, <laughs> you're going to go to hell. It was a very quiet ride at home <laughs> after that because he said that as we're leaving the parking lot. So, <laughs> but that's, that was offensive. You no, know, my mom was highly offended, but as the Bible says, out of the mouths of babes, you know, that comes there. So, brothers, it comes down to this. Do we believe the gospel? You know, if, if Are we too worried about offending people to actually proclaim the gospel? If you believe the gospel, we are not going to be too embarrassed, too uh, worried. And that's going to reflect itself in also engaging social issues. But it's the gospel that has to be the primary thing. The church is not called to feed the poor. And we can talk more about that later if you want to. The church is not called to provide a, 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 a adoption services. The church is not called to provide uh, dating services. The church is called to make disciples of Jesus Christ through the proclamation of the gospel. But if we're too worried about offending people, we as a, a, the church, the institutional church, will fail to do that. We do that with compassion. Remember the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 that he looked over the multitude and Matthew tells us he was moved with compassion for them. Uh, somebody paraphrased that as saying that his stomach was tied into a knot because the word compassion is kind of related to the word for guts or splint or different ones at the time uh, there. And that's how we do as well. But we're not, in we're not ashamed of the gospel because we're convinced that it is the power of God 
unto salvation. And that in order to save, you're going to have, in order to point people to Christ, you may have to first offend them before they can be gained by the work of the Spirit. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the sure word.